This video describes the design and build of magic carpet lift for a ballet production of Aladdin. We'll cover the desired effect, the choice of mechanism, safety, and understanding forces and moments. If you're going to try this, I really recommend that you understand the mechanics and the safety implications. Getting this wrong could result in injury or death. This video is for information only. The desired effect was to give the illusion of flying. I decided that 120 centimeters or four feet lift will be adequate to raise the characters above the heads of the smaller children. The theater has black curtains halfway up the stage. These could be used to hide the mechanism and there's four meters clearance to the back wall. Only vertical motion would be required. Horizontal motion could be implied by having the other characters on stage move relative to the magic carpet as they wave goodbye. A moving star field projected onto the curtains could assist in this. I considered electric and hydraulic lifts or forklift mechanisms, but speed and jerk rate limiting would be difficult, as well as requiring feet protruding under the curtain for stability. I'm comfortable working in timber and cutting and drilling steel, any welding would have to be contracted out, so this was kept to a minimum. The parallel beam lift was chosen as it's simple, strong, and keeps the carpet platform horizontal. It also allows a natural looking up and down motion due to the effort by the operators on the rear. Safety will be covered later in the video. We'll be using metric measurements for this. If you're in the former colonies, I'm afraid you'll need to catch up. Even Britain went metric after he left them. Force is measured in newtons, and for our purposes, we can consider the force to be the load multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity. A 100 kilogram load will exert a downward force of 1,000 newtons, or 1 kilonewton. For the show in question, there will be one or two dancers on the lift when in operation. The maximum load will be 130 kilograms, centered about 800 millimeters forward of the pivots. I had a fundamental misconception about the law of the lever in this application. I had assumed that the longer the green operator handle, then the greater the mechanical advantage. This is not correct, as the rigid linkage of both ends applies the vertical loads to the pivots. That means as far as lifting the load is concerned, it doesn't matter whether the load is here or here, and whether we apply the lifting forces here or here. The catch is that applying the lifting force in the wrong place will introduce torsion on the vertical stand, which will tend to rotate, and we don't want this. If we imagine that the platform bracket is pivoting about axle A, it's easy to see that axle B will exert a force in the direction shown. Similarly, if we apply a load on the operator bar as shown, it will pivot about axle C and axle D will exert force as shown. The result is that the upper beam, BD, is in tension. If we do the same exercise and consider the turning about pivots B and D, we can see that the lower beam, AC, is in compression. If we get everything balanced, the situation will look like this. Notice that E and F are in balance and the net horizontal force on each is zero. Now let's make an extreme adjustment to demonstrate an imbalance in beam forces. We'll move the operator force directly above D. This will eliminate the tension on D and the compression on C and cause a turning moment on the uprights. This is bad. The ideal is to have only vertical loading on the uprights, so there's no tendency for the whole machine to move or tip over. My understanding of this was greatly helped by the use of StructuralAnalyzer.com's online graphical calculator. It's intended for civil engineering structures, and for this application we're doing a few odd arrangements to get useful results. Here I'm showing the construction of a frame to check the turning moment on the uprights. The main points to note on this frame are, there's a fixed point of reference on the center of the upright. 
Any beams with a regular connection to a node are considered solid one-piece connections. Hollow dots at the end of a beam signify hinged joints. We're using a horizontal roller support on the left end to measure the reaction force, which is the force required to lift the passengers. And each node is numbered and each beam is numbered, but we won't be using those. All of this should become more obvious as we work through a couple of examples. OK, we have our structural analyzer frame created. We're going to create some supports. The toolbar buttons open and close dialogues for the various features. Here we're looking at the supports. So we're going to add in a fixed support. We click the start button. It prompts us to pick up nodes and we'll add that there. So that's our reference for the whole job. We're going to apply the load at this end on the platform but we need to restrain this end of the uh, system. So we're going to put in a roller, which is horizontal, like that. And that should be adequate. We'll turn off the supports and we'll turn on our loads. I've got it set up already for 1.3 kilonewtons or 130 kilogram load. Press the start button. We'll place that on there. We can turn off the loads and just run the solve. And we see immediately that we've got 1.3 kilonewtons reaction on the roller bearing there. So that represents the effort the operators would have to put in. And rather nicely, we can see here that we have no turning moment on the uprights. So that's perfect too. Now let's examine if we were to move the operators out further and see what would happen if we had a larger lever. So here we're out at 2.4 meters out from the main pivot. We run the solver here. We can see we still get a 1.3 kilonewton uh, reaction force here. So it hasn't helped the operators at all, but it has given us a problem here where we've now got a 780 newton meter torque on the uprights putting a bit of a twist into those which could lead to a dangerous situation. So we'll go back to 1.8 meters from the center as this one is 1.8 positive. OK, now to assist the operators, we're going to apply some counterweights here. So We'll put in this time 50 kilograms, which will give us 0 0.5 kilonewtons. Press start, and we're just going to apply that here. We can turn off the loads and run the solver now. And we find, as expected, the reaction force here is reduced to 800 newtons. So that's taken a load off the operators. Uh, but we've introduced a torque here of 400 newton meters. So let's see if we can eradicate that. So we'll move the operators out away from here to try and generate a bit more tension on the top beams and compression on the lower beams. Run the solver again, and we're down to 240 newton meters. So we'll move out again, down to 80 newton meters. So we're very close to having good balance. And we run there, we can see that we've got 80 newton meters the opposite direction. So somewhere between there and there is the ideal point. So if we zoom in a bit, move back one step, zoom back out and solve again. And you can see that we've no torque on that. So at what position does that occur? And it occurs at minus 2.3 meters on the x-axis. So that means the operator should be pulling at 1.3 meters from the pivot point here. We'll do one more calculation using the software. We'll apply a trick here. We're going to use roller verticals to display values on the tension on the beams. Now just I'm not flexible in the setup on this, so these are going to give the opposite direction arrows 
that we saw in my illustration, but that's fine. Run the solver, and we can see at this situation, when we're 2.3 meters from the origin, we've got 2.08 kilonewtons on the left, 2.08 kilonewtons on the right, and perfectly balanced on the lower beam as well. Again, if we pull the operator position in or out, we can see that we get an imbalance of only 960 versus 2.08. And if we go out, we've got more on the left side than we have on the right side. I'd like to thank Miroslav Stibor for making this software freely available on the web and answering a couple of questions I had and really clarifying my thinking. Meanwhile, it's a sunny evening, so let's get back outside. The casters I've used for this, I got from a surplus scrap and they don't have locks on them. So I made a couple of, couple of chocks to stop the assembly rolling while on stage. The rear wheels where I'm standing now are steerable. I've got the safety brake in my hand, release that. And this is very important with the counterweights on there that the 50 kg we were using on the backside would cause the platform to lift. So we had a queuing system where the dancer would sit on the platform. Someone would signal to the crew behind the curtain that it was safe to remove the brake and to apply the lift. The platform was held on with a five tech screws. These are self tappers. Drill a pilot hole and the timber will screw straight into the steel. Here I've turned up two little stands at brackets at the back to support the cushions. These help obscure any gap in the curtain. And it's quite a surprise when the thing starts to move. So as mentioned, just a little bit of motion at the top is all that's needed. And you can make that very smooth, which would be quite difficult to do with any hydraulic or electric mechanism. Lower them to the ground. Now, at this case, we would then put the safety brake back in and the dancer would remain on until we signal through an intermediary that it's safe to disembark. Here you can see the axle arrangement and some safety straps just to, as mentioned, we have 200 kg pull on that bar. So I put some strapping around it just to assist uh, in the event of a split. And then we have a very heavy duty ratchet strap tying the front to the back. So again, it's belt and braces and hands and pockets too. If the platform bracket was to break loose and swing out and hit someone's head, uh, it could be fatal. Here you can see we put in an A-frame and bolted that. Even though the upright shouldn't experience any torque, the A-frame just gives a bit of extra security there. The OR clips make it very easy to pull the bars in and out, secures them nice and tightly and makes a setup toolless. The masking tape on the operator handle is to improve visibility for the video and also to make it more visible backstage. I painted up the inside in case there was a gap in the curtains. The wood was very light in color and the black would just make it less obvious should the curtains gape at all. The jig does fold up uh, into a little over 2.2 meters or thereabouts. I can never remember which sequence this should go in. And I think I've messed up here that the I should have done the other end first to tuck it in.
the chocks can be dropped onto some screws to hold them in place so they don't get lost. So that could be tied up in that position. Okay. Here's a quick look at the setup on stage. We've one curtain open so we can see what's going on. Here are the muscle men at the back. Okay, that should do. And here's a look at how we set up the counterweights. No, that's and fine. The ones in the theater had through holes in them, so we were able to mount them without ropes and it was very secure. Regarding the welding, there's nothing special other than to make sure that everything is square. With some of the longer pieces, the tolerances stack up. Drawings are available in the links below with the rough parts list and a document with the operating procedure, which you may find useful for developing your own. If you enjoyed this video, you might also like to see the genie lamp. Link below. Bye.